Welcome back to Maturing the Bride. We are in book number seven. And in book number seven, we're calling it The Broken Engagement. We're trying to say something very shocking to most people. And that is this, not all Christians are going to be a part of the Bride of Christ. I do not believe the scriptures teach that all Christians are going to be a part of the Bride. That's what we're trying to look at and examine in the scriptures. You've got to challenge me if you're saying, no, that's not right. You've got to look at the scriptures with me to try to see it. We are now in chapter number three, and it's titled, I Never Knew You. Now, before we jump into the scriptures, we usually jump into the scriptures, there's a danger that I want to talk about, and here's the danger. Theological fluidity is needed. What do I mean by that? Men and women, most of us grew up in a church or a denomination. We heard what they had to say. We heard the teaching of what they had to say, and we've never looked at any other possibilities. And we've said, well, that's doctrine. That's what my pastor teaches. That's what I agree with. And so we have what I call theological baggage. Theological baggage that we're carrying with us everywhere we go. I had the same baggage. When I married my wife, we went into the Presbyterian Church. The Presbyterian Church says this about the Bride of Christ. The Catholic or worldwide church cannot be seen with the eye. It consists of all the elect who have been and now and shall be gathered into one body of which Jesus Christ is the head. The church is the bride, the full glory of God who fills everything. The church is the bride. All right, that's kind of saying it straight right out there, and that's what I was brought up with. Maybe if you were brought up Catholic, you're going to find basically the same thing. The church is betrothed, espoused, and promised as the intended bride of her husband, Jesus Christ. The marriage is not consummated. That is yet to come when he returns for us. Meaning all Christians, all of the church is going to be a part of the bride. If you were to go to Google and just Google who is the bride of Christ, you would get a lot of different answers. If you were to go to websites you trust, possibly like Bible study tools, you'll read these words. Paul ends, sums up what we are preparing for. The church is the bride of Christ. And it goes on. The church is the bride of Christ. If you were to go to Christianity.com, you'd read these words. Scripture also promises a final reunion between Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. His bride, the church. They're saying the same thing. If you were to go to this one, gotquestions.org, I go to this one a lot, you'd read the same words. Christ, the bridegroom, has sacrificially and lovingly chosen the church to be his bride. Men and women, it's an uphill battle. If you're beginning to agree with the teaching that you've already had in the first two lectures, it's still an uphill battle because we are going against centuries of doctrine, centuries of doctrine and theology that has been laid down. And it is so tough. It is so tough to teach an old dog new tricks. Jesus says no one puts new wine into old wineskins. It is so hard to do that with people who are steeped in their theology, who are carrying around a lot of theological baggage. But there is good news, and the good news is this. Not everybody believes that the church is the bride. You can go to other websites. They'll say things like this. While there is a lamb's wife, the bride of Christ, it is not the church. Right there, it is not the church. They go and quote Revelation 21, 9 to 10, clearly states that the bride, the Lamb's wife, is the holy Jerusalem. In other words, it's the city. You can go to other websites and they'll say, well, you know, this is a non-essential thought, whether or not the church is the bride. We can just kind of, it's not a big deal. Just kind of sleep through it when you go over the doctrinal statement uh, at your church as you're reading through it. You can just sleep. Through. I'm saying, no, no, it is a big deal. It's a very big deal because it has eternal ramifications. Men and women, I'm challenging you that there can be a time when Christ says to God the Father, this one is not worthy to be a part of the bride. And that will be astounding. And I see it there in the scriptures. And so I want to say, wake up, wake up. Think through this. Remember, you can be a part of the body of Christ, but not be a part of the bride of Christ. Now, I know for some people it's giving a headache, but hang
hang in there because now we're going to another passage of text which backs this up. It's the parable of the ten virgins. The parable of the ten virgins, and we're going to focus on what happened to the five foolish virgins. We're in Matthew chapter 25. Let's kick it off in verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. All right, I want to tear apart this verse to understand it. Let's start off. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps. Key phrase, took their lamps. Jesus says you are the light of the world. So all ten took their lamps. All ten had their lanterns and they were lights to the world. So it seems to be that they're all believers because they had lamps, they were lights to the world, continues on, and they went to meet the bridegroom. They went to meet the bridegroom? Wow! They were expecting the bridegroom to come. Yes, that's right. Okay, they went in faith to meet him. Yes, they did. Oh, sounds like a believer. Yeah, it sure does. They're not at all like the people in Luke chapter 19, verse 14. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. They weren't those kind of people. No, these five foolish virgins that we call them seem to be believers. And if you have been following all of the teaching, I am a once saved, always saved person. Once saved, always saved. If you have faith, you have present tense eternal life. Once saved, always saved. And so these seem to be very clearly believers who are waiting for the Lord to come back. Let's pick it up, verse 2 through 5. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. They took no oil with them. Men and women, as a Boy Scout, when I grew up as a Boy Scout, our motto was be prepared. Be prepared. But these women weren't prepared. These virgins weren't prepared. They did not take enough oil. In Revelation 3.3, 3, Remember what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come against you. He's saying in that one, you've got to be ready. Got to be ready. At all times, you need to be ready because one day I'm going to come like a thief and you won't know it. You won't know it. But these five foolish versions were believers who were not preparing for his return. They weren't preparing for his return. They, they thought that they had enough oil. They thought they had enough good works. They basically were saying, I'm good enough. And they were thinking, look, you know, God gave me his son. He'll give me anything. Of course, I'm going to be a part of the bride. And they felt entitled. Men and women, if there's any one thing that I want to say, we, the American church, I don't know about other churches, but at least the American church, we feel entitled. We have an entitlement mentality. Because I prayed the prayer, I should get all the benefits. And that's not what I see in the scriptures. I don't see that in the scriptures. Praying a prayer does not entitle you to all the benefits that God has for his mature believers. Let's go back to the text, verses 6 through 9. But at midnight there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. What was happening? They were embarrassed. They realized that they had not done enough good works to impress the bridegroom. In fact, they realized that they had been lazy. And so as a result, they thought, oh, no, we've got trouble here. There are some yellow flags rolling in their spirits saying, warning, 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 something's wrong here. Let's keep breaking down this verse. It says, but the wise answered, saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. Key words, buy for yourselves. Men and women, buying something costs money. 
Well, okay, yeah, so it costs money. So could this be salvation? Could they be saying, hey, you've got to go out and buy some things in order to earn your salvation? Well, of course not. No, salvation is free. It is absolutely free. We see this in Revelation 21. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Without payment, men and women, buy for yourselves. This cannot be salvation. This can't be salvation. So, hmm, what does cost you? Ah, that is the key question. What does cost us? Well, let's look in the scriptures. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Oh, you want to be a disciple of Christ? That is going to cost you everything. Next passage. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, verse 33. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. And Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me. In other words, if you want that deep fellowship with me, if you want to be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Men and women, discipleship costs you everything. Everything. Salvation, that's free. Discipleship, it costs you everything. And these people ended up as children, not disciples. They ended up with a mere relationship with God, but they had broken fellowship with God when the bridegroom came. Matthew chapter 25, let's keep reading. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Again, let's tear apart this passage here and look at it to understand it. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. Men and women. Their intentions, their good intentions, were too late. They were too late. God says, I gave you 80 years, however many years he's given you. I've given you those many years on earth to prove yourself. You can't make this up in the last second. It's got to be a lifestyle that I'm looking for. A lifestyle of faithfulness. Let's go back to the text. And those who were ready went in with them. They were ready. They weren't lazy. They weren't wasting time. They weren't worried about their kingdom. They were worried about God's kingdom. They were ready. They got to go in. And the door was shut. Now, here's the key question. Is this the door to heaven? No, I want to say no. No. It's not the door to heaven, because if it is the door to heaven, then it's salvation by works, because they had to go out and buy things. This is not the door to heaven. This is the door to the wedding banquet. The door to the wedding banquet was shut, and they weren't allowed to go into the wedding banquet. Okay? Make that differentiation. The door is the door to the wedding banquet. Let's continue on with the verse. Matthew 25, they said, Lord, Lord, open to us. Lord, Lord, hey, these are believers. These are not the ones who said, I hate this guy. I don't want him to rule over us. They called him Lord. They wanted him to be their Lord. They never knew how to apply that. They lived for themselves. But these are believers. And then he says these terrible words. I do not know you. Uh-oh. Sounds like they're going to hell. And that it was the door to heaven. No. Men and women, the Greek word for no is this word, I do. It's a Greek word that has many definitions, but I want you to focus on this definition down at the very bottom. To have regard for one, cherish, 
pay attention to. It's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12, where it says these words. It's translated differently. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. There, I do, is translated to respect. So you can accurately translate that word to respect. So what Jesus could be saying in Matthew 25 is these words. I do not respect you. I do not respect you. You don't have enough good works. Look, I've been watching your life the whole time. You played video games most of your adult life in your free time. Okay, your marriage was a wreck. You really got after your kids and got hard on them, yelling at them, getting angry with them. I saw you steal things from the office. And look, when you went to my word to have a quiet times, you were looking for yourself the whole time. And when you prayed, it was all about what I could do for you. You were far more worried about me advancing your kingdom. You never once asked how you could advance my kingdom. Everything was about you. I didn't respect you. I didn't respect your life. And I'm not going to graduate you. I'm not going to promote you to be in leadership in my kingdom as a part of my bride because you didn't show yourself to be faithful. I do not respect you. Men and women, God does not promote unskilled workers. You don't get to be at the head of his family business, ruling and reigning, when you haven't gone through the training yet. Remember, you can be a part of the body of Christ, but not be a part of the bride of Christ. These five foolish virgins were not allowed to enter into the wedding banquet. They were not allowed into the wedding banquet. The door that was closed was the wedding banquet door. They still have relationship with God. They still have unconditional love of God, but they're going to realize, oh my goodness, I lost so much. I lost so much by living selfishly there on the earth. He then ends that parable by saying, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. He's saying, be very careful. Be very careful. Watch. He says in Ephesians 5, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Be very careful. Make the most opportunity. He's saying, don't fall when you get old. 2 John chapter 1, verse 8, watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. He's saying, you need to finish strong. You need to finish strong. 2 Timothy 2, if we endure, we will also reign with him. Men and women, I want to challenge you, don't be like the five foolish virgins. Don't be like the five foolish virgins. Don't think, well, I prayed the prayer. I'm a Christian. I know that. I go to church every Sunday. They thought that they were entitled. Men and women, you are not entitled to be a part of the bride because you prayed a prayer. You need to do good works. Good works done in the power of the Holy Spirit, yielding to him, saying, Lord, lead my life and guide me, choosing to follow his lead. And then you earn the right to be a part of the bride as you finish strong. Don't be like the five foolish virgins. Okay, woo, that was a lot. But let's review. We're talking about the parable of the ten virgins, all right? Five of them were wise. They took extra oil. They were ready. Five were foolish. They did not bring extra oil, and they were not ready. They all had lanterns. They all were lights. These are all believers, but the five foolish virgins ran out of oil. And it says at the very end, Buy for yourselves. Go to the dealers. Buy for yourselves. Buying something, that's not salvation. That is not salvation. This is not the door to heaven that was closed. It's the door to the wedding banquet that was closed. Why? Because they did not do 
good works. Men and women, here's the key thing you need to know. They started the race strong, but they didn't finish strong. And you've got to finish strong to be a part of the bride. Because they did not finish strong, they don't get to go to the wedding banquet. They still have a relationship with God. They still have God's unconditional love. But they lost out on so much. Okay, that was a lot. But it's another passage backing up this concept that not every Christian is going to be a part of the bride. Okay, in our next time together, what will our reaction be when the door is shut? The scriptures actually talk about that. Thank you for watching Maturing the Bride. Hi. I hope you have been challenged and encouraged by what you have learned in the broken engagement. Listen, I don't know about you, but when I see these scriptures, it puts a fire in my soul. It is burning deeply within me. And I want to get this message out so that the body of Christ will prepare themselves to be a part of the bride by doing good works. I am so tired of the entitlement mentality. If you feel like there's a fire in your soul, please get others to watch this and consider making a tax-deductible gift to our ministry of Unveiling Glory so that we can get this message out, not only here in the United States, but around the world. We specialize in 